Uh, and the third thing is that uh, two years after getting his PhD, uh, he started a record label as an economics experiment. And I, I encourage all of you to ask him about that afterwards. <laughs> okay, so okay. Colin Kemmer. Thanks. Um. Well, it wasn't. It was actually to make money. <laughs> the record label. Um, thanks, Kevin. Um, so I've, I've had a really great visit here. It's a really the Green College is really beautiful, and um, it's been quite fun. I mean, I really enjoy. We, I gave a talk in economics yesterday, and um, talking here. We I really like doing these things. It's it's quite fun for us. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, a narrow part of behavioral game theory, and um, the. Many of you probably know lots of game theory. The first few talks are going to be kind of baby talk for you. And then I'll dig into a lot of data. So um, the distinction I want to draw is between equilibrium game theory. I'll talk about Nash equilibrium, not say too much about lots of interesting refinements of that, designed to eliminate multiple Nash equilibria and deal with um, other things that happen in more co in complex games. And I'll compare that with co what's called a cognitive hierarchy or sometimes level K approaches. Those aren't exactly the same, but they're a part of a family. That's quite similar. And by the way, Kevin and James Wright here have worked on this too. So they're very much not just local experts, but among the top three groups in the world on this. Um, he said authoritatively. Um, so if you're interested in this type of thing, there are people to ask that are nearby. OK. And the, the crucial distinction is the following, which is um, uh, Kevin used the word rationality. And so in economic, in economic theory, first, it, it's a, word, it's a load of a lot of stuff, so we sometimes avoid it. But here, what's important about rationality is best response, optimizing given beliefs, and accuracy of beliefs, or what's often called more generally in economics, rational expectations. That is, there's a way in which people behave, and rational expectations means we know, we know correctly what other opponents will do. So if you combine those two features, optimal choice given belief and accurate beliefs, that gives you an equilibrium. Okay. Now, early in the history of Nash equilibrium, very early in Nash's 17-page PhD thesis, he speculates very briefly about how you could have, how an equilibrium could come about. So, so for a long time, there's no real dynamic saying, you know, what, whether, whether, is it learning? Is it population dynamics, like replicator fitness in a, in a biological population? Is it something like communication? We talk to each other and we arrive in equilibrium. Do we all hire the same auction consultants? And that means we're going to get auct equilibrium auction bids in, um, Spectrum options coming up. Um, and for, to, to, so Nash said in his thesis, well, it might come about from mass action, like groups of people will change en masse until they constantly adjust to their behavior until they're at this mutual, mutual best response point in which they're accurately guessing and optimizing. Um, but not much was said about that for a long time. So an alternative approach, a, a specifically non-equilibrium approach, Sometimes we think of it as kind of pre-equilibrium, because it might give us a model of what's going to happen before rational expectations emerge from learning or from some other dynamic process, is cognitive hierarchy. And I, I think there are, there are other solution concepts mentioned there, which I won't have time to talk about, which are a little bit more technical and some, somewhat useful. Um, but the cognitive hierarchy approach is very straightforward. You start with zero-step players, and they're going to do something we think is probably non-strategic. That is, they're not thinking about other people and heuristic. I'll give a few examples and come back to this. Once you have zero step players, the, the one step players think they're playing zero step players. Two step players think they're playing ones and zeros. That's the cognitive hierarchy specification. If two step players think they're just playing one step players, that's called level K. So there's just a slight difference in, in, in assumption about the nature of beliefs. And in both of these approaches, we assume essentially kind of a Lake Wobegon effect. Everybody thinks they're the smartest person. So the, the K step players think there are no other K step players. If you allow case to players to think there are other Ks too, you're kind of immediately sucked a little bit into equilibrium dynamics because the Ks have to figure out what Ks do, knowing that Ks figure out Ks. And it doesn't sharply distinguish these non-equilibrium approaches from equilibrium. So we typically assume this kind of overconfidence, you might say, or bias. OK, I'm going to talk about um, uh, two games pretty quickly, so-called P-Beauty Contest and Loopy Games. I'll say just a little bit about eye tracking and endogenizing thinking very, very briefly and come back to what is level zero. <coughs> okay, so uh, this is a game that's been studied a lot. Uh, Rosemary Nagel first studied in 1985. I should cite her here, it's on the next slide. And she called it the guessing game, which is a, a t just a terrible name because every, every game is a guessing game. <laughs> so I don't know, and 
So anyway, anyway, so it's still called the guessing game, but not by me. Uh, I, I call it the beauty contest game because in her original paper and lots of other things, there's a famous passage from John Maynard Keynes where he says, the stock market's like this kind of beauty contest in which you don't care about the most beautiful, but you care about who people think is the most beautiful, and those people think about care about who people think. And so you could get something like a price bubble, which I spoke about yesterday. You could get people valuing stocks at a really high price because they think other people will value stocks even higher in the future and things like that. So that's related to the Keynesian idea. In fact, that's why Keynesian was really interested in bubbles, not in games. The rules are simple. Pick a number from 0 to 100. Everyone does this simultaneously. And we're going to compute the average. This has been done many, many times. It's really simple to do. And two, the closest to some multiple of the average, in this case, is 2 thirds. But you can put a different number in there if you want to, uh, uh, wins. So you want to be you know, closer to the average that you want to be below the average towards zero, but not too far towards zero, and not too close to the average. And everyone else is trying to do the same thing. So if you think about the dynamics in this game, in equilibrium, right? In equilibrium, your beliefs must be accurate. So if you're all thinking, well, I'm going to pick 33, because that's two thirds of uniform choices across the interval, right? If you believe other people will pick 33, like you do, then you should pick 22. But if you think other people should pick 22, you should pick two thirds of 22, and so forth. So. The, the requirement of optimization and accuracy of beliefs, as well as symmetry, leads you to a, a number which is equal to two-thirds of itself. If everyone thinks everyone will pick that, that's the number that will actually be picked. And that's the solution to x star equals two-thirds of x, which is zero in this interval. OK, so that's the unique, the unique Nash prediction. And there's no question, look, in this game, we kind of picked a game in which the unique Nash prediction is extreme. And and it relies on kind of more strategic thinking than we think is you're likely to see in the population. So sure enough, here's a group from um, National University of Singapore undergraduates. There's a big, this is the prediction. The equilibrium prediction is that everyone will be at one. We're not allowing any soft max or stochastic choice, but of course, it wouldn't be difficult to put that in. And that's been done in many, many studies in what's called quantal response equilibrium by my colleague Tom Palfrey and several others. Here the data are in burgundy. So you basically see a couple of spikes around 50 and 35. There's a few people picking low numbers. They don't win either, right? So remember, the Nash equilibrium is not the answer to the question, how do you win this game, unless everyone is choosing the Nash equilibrium. Okay, the answer to the question, how do you win this game, is to have some kind of model of likely behavior, which may include non equilibrium. But you should, it'd be nice if you had a model that isn't too game specific, and then you could port it from game to game to game to game. And so that's what we're trying to do with these types of models. Just as Nash equilibrium can be used in many, many, in all finite games, and that's part of why it's been so useful in social science uh, and in computer science, too. This is another data set of 9,000 observations, so you see the spikes very sharply, even though the percentages are small. These are um, newspaper and magazine contests where people wrote in a number. And if you put all these data together, you see a spike of 33 and a 22 and then a 1, and the average is 23. So if you pick 15, you'd win this game. All right. So that's just a kind of um, hors d'oeuvre to get going. This is Reinhard Zelten, who in 1988 said, the natural way of looking at game situations is not based <coughs> on circular concepts. By that, he meant equilibrium, which is a solution of a fixed point. Right? The, the strategies people pick are the argmax of, of payoffs given the strategies people pick. Right? So the strategies are on both sides of the equation, and you have to solve recursively. But rather, Zelten said, on a step-by-step -step reasoning procedure. So he did, he didn't exactly lay out this hierarchy, but a number of people, also Ken Binmore, in the, in the 90s were kind of thinking along those lines. Okay, just a little bit more detail about the structure. There's not many equations here, but there's more in the original source papers. So what do we need to make this thing work? Well, we need a distribution of the steps of reasoning f of k. How many people are doing one step, a two step, zero step? Um, the zero steps, as I said, choose heuristically. We'd like there to be either either one theory of what exactly that means, or maybe a couple of slightly different theories that are sensitive to the game. I'll come back to that again at the end. And then the case that others think others are zero k up to k minus one. As I mentioned, you probably can't see this, but if the ground truth of f of k looks like this, this is approximately Poisson, the CH model, if you're level three, says you think people are zero, one, and two, you just ignore the threes and above. You have no idea that that exists, or you don't, you know, it's not part of your beliefs. And you, re you prorate and reapportion that mass to here. In the level k approach, if you're level three, you think everyone's level two. 
And um, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but, but both approaches have been useful. In some respects, level K is a little easier to work with analytically, particularly in games with many play more than two players. And um, we think they fit kind of approximately well. There's not a lot of games that, that indicate one is much better than the other, and there may even be hard to find them, but James Wright's been we're looking. Okay. So what's f of k? What's a reasonable distribution? Well, there's a bunch of approaches. The, the one we have um, found useful and is nice and um, parsimonious is a Poisson distribution, where uh, the percentage of people using level k is e to the minus tau times tau to the k divided by k. That's k factorial. K. Okay. And usually we think the tau is around um, one and a half, or one or two. That is the, the mean number of steps. Tau is the mean, by the way, for Poisson, and it's also the variance. So it's a single parameter distribution rather than a two parameters or more complex distribution. That means that you know we might be able to prove theorems about what happens for various tau values in different games and things like that. Uh, and it, the Poisson distribution also comes from this simple principle. So if you think that relative frequencies of k levels obey this property, then it follows immediately that it's Poisson. Here's a picture of Poisson with tau equals one and a half. You can see that there's a, the mode is one step of reasoning. There's quite a few twos. And then the higher orders, because of the k factorial, the percentage of very high order thinkers drops off very fast, which we think is plausible psychologically. There have been lots of applications. This is just to show you that they're out there, including a, um, where's Terry? This is a global games paper by Terry Neeland, who graduated here a couple of years ago. She's at UCL now. She's doing quite well. She's a local hero, or heroine, as far as I'm concerned. Game number two. Uh, if, if a talented Swedish student whose advisors Jorgen Weevil or Tor Ellingson says, I want to come and visit at Caltech for a few months and I have my own money. Uh, can I come and visit? The answer is yes. <laughs> or yeah, maybe. I don't know what Swedish is. So Robert came. Um, we didn't actually start this project until he went home. He's an extremely clever guy working in Stockholm now. And he emailed one point and said, you know, there's this lottery being played in Sweden right now. And the way it works is that players choose a number from 1 to 99,999. That's a weird upper limit, but that's because that's the one of the numbers that fit on this little card if you fill a card out in the lottery store. And you can go to the lottery store and buy one of these cards. And for each number you pick, you can pick up to six per card, but you can get 10 cards and pick 60 if you want. For each number you pick, you pay one euro. And lots of people play. At every day the lottery closes at a certain time, and then there's a TV show. And the TV show shows you the winning numbers. And, um, the lowest unique number wins 10,000 euros. Okay. So this is a nice, simple, ga simple game. It's, it's rules are simple, right? Everyone picks an integer. The lowest unique integer wins. If there's no unique integer, then it's the, it's the lowest integer that two people picked. And if there's no one with two, then you go to three and so on. But in this large group, there's, there's always, it turns out, there's always a unique number empirically. Um, so. Um, this is going to be a cool game, right? Because to study cognitive hierarchy as well as Nash. Because first, the Nash equilibrium can be derived. It's quite interesting and complex. In fact, it turns out that if you have a fixed number of players, as we usually assume in game theory, like 53,000 people play every single day, then we could not computationally find the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. The mixed strategy is going to be a probability distribution of the chance that, that a particular individual symmetric mixed equilibrium, an individual picks one or two or three. So you can just draw it like a probability distribution. So we could not compute the mixed equilibrium. I, I don't think you can compute it either. But as I said the other day, every time I've given this to a mixed audience with computer scientists, I get an email from somebody saying, I think I can figure this out. I'll email you later. And apparently, in computer science, later means <laughs> never. <laughs> Or, or I'm sorry, the runtime was, the worst case runtime was uh, too high. Anyway, so I wish if somebody could figure it out, I mean, it, computationally it's very difficult because you can imagine the common torques are really hard. Or you have to compute the chance that, that you're unique and that nobody is lower than you is unique and then you have to do that for lots of combinations when there, there are a lot of players. We can compute it actually, by the way, for, um, for small games like for 10 players or something like that. So it can be computed for small games, but for, for this particular one. But thank you, Roger Meyerson, Nobel laureate, who's at Chicago now. He was at Northwestern when I first worked there. Uh, it turns out if the number of players isn't the same every day, but that also comes from a Poisson distribution, it's just a total coincidence that there's two fish 
in this story in Vancouver is a Poisson distribution of types, at least that's one assumption, and there's this Poisson distribution of number of players in the Swedish loopy game. If you make a Poisson distribution, then it turns out you can actually solve this thing. It's very beautiful, and along with revelation principles. It's, um, and many others, one of Roger's very great insights. And in fact, it has a nice elegant structure, it looks like <coughs> physical sciences. If, if P of K plus one is the percentage of, of probability of playing K plus one, then the, the percentage E to the N, N is the number of players, times P of K plus one <coughs> equals E, N times P of K minus N P of K. So you can solve, right, for the percentage of people playing two is a function of one, percentage of three is a function of two, blah, 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 up to 99,999 is a function of 99,998. Then you have a summing up constraint. You have 100,000 minus one equations and 100,000 minus one unknowns, and you can solve it. And thank you, Robert and Joseph Wang, for doing that. Okay, so on the left, you see uh, all the data from the first week, 250,000 observations or so, actually 350. And um, this shows the entire number range from zero up to 100,000 minus one. <clears throat> okay, and what you see is that there's a lot of small numbers. That's going to be kind of a hallmark of what you might expect from cognitive hierarchy. So the level one players say, I don't know what people are going to pick. If I pick one and I'm unique, I'll definitely win because that's the lowest. So the, the level one guys say, I'm going to pick one. I don't think anyone else will think of that. <laughs> right? So they're not being too strategic either, right? Because they think they're playing people who are random. The level twos think, I think guys are going to pick one. <laughs> I'm picking two, <laughs> right? No one will think of two, right? So it turns out that to fit these data, you need not only those steps of reasoning, but in addition, you need kind of a soft max that sort of spreads the choices out a lot more. Okay. So in this application, we're going to combine the Poisson distribution of types of level of level steps with soft max. Okay. And this is the national that we here. The right side of the picture shows you if you take the lowest 10,000 numbers. What does it look like? It just zooms in so you can see better. And you can see, for example, in the first week, about 150 people are picking these low numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 4. And 50 people pick 2,000. These are basically birth years, right? There are people who were born in 1989 who picked 1989. In fact, it's, it's kind of cool. The people who were born in 1989 picked 1990. People who were born in 1990, they think, wait a minute. That's a round number. A lot of people are going to pick 1990. <laughs> I'm going to pick 19. So there's actually a dip. In the, it's, in, it's in our paper. I won't show you today. There's actually a dip around the round numbers. So the 1990s thing, everyone's going to pick 1990 because it's round. I won't pick it. And actually, they should pick it, right? <laughs> so th this shows you, you know, how you can make mistakes if you do these kind of limited reasoning. OK. The other thing I'll just note is um, game theory here is pretty amazing, right? This is the Nash prediction. It says that there's a very flat probability that goes slightly down, meaning one should be chosen most often, and then two a little less often than three, and it bends down at 5,513. So that just comes from like the magic of math. Uh, here's the cognitive hierarchy fit. You get a tau value of 1.80, which is pretty close to what you would get from those lab experiments from P-Beauty contest, which is around two, right? And if you combine that with softmax, you fit the thing pretty nicely. Too many low numbers, people are being a little naive, Kind of some high numbers, that's probably just noise, like a level zero noise. And then there's a gap between two and 5,000, that's where more people should be picking. And often that's where the winners are. But if you, we have to replicate that in the lab, the lab data is actually very, very close. It's a smaller scale game in UCLA co uh, college. And if you run this over time, this is the last week, and then they stop the lottery. In the seventh week, after 49 days of practice, you're starting to fill in the distribution pretty nicely. There's still some spikes, but if you kind of smooth this, it would look pretty close to this. Amazing prediction. OK. Uh, next. All right, we take these kinds of theories, algorithmic theory, seriously as models of cognition. So we're going to look at eye tracking, what are people looking at, and also at fMRI. But I won't show you that today. We have a few studies on that. OK. Um, this is an interesting private information betting game. But you, you, some of you may have known this, or you may know another version. So in this game, here's how it works. States A, B, C are chosen randomly with one third probability, independently each time. And this partition is known to all the players. Here's what this means. If you're player one, if the state is A or B, and you choose to bet, and the other guy bets, if it states A, you win 25. If the bet states B, you win five, OK? If, if the state is C, you have a singleton partition. You know it's C for sure. So this structure means 
if it's A or B, you don't know which it is. You just know it's the set A or B. OK, got it? And if it's a singleton C, you know that it's C for sure. Or if you don't bet, you can pick S and get 10. So if you bet, you're basically choosing to get the payoff that's available given the state if the other person bets. And if you don't want to bet, just pick S. In this case, you'll get 10. OK? So this is a very nice game to, to, to carefully dissect different steps of reasoning. For example, this is what we call an F version of the game. Suppose you're player one and you get the information C. You know you're getting 20 for sure if you bet. Or you could get 10. So you choose to bet. If the other guy bets with you, you're going to get 20. If the other guy says, no, I don't want to bet, everyone reverts and gets S. This is a simple dominant choice. This is kind of a sanity check, right? If people don't get this right, then something strange is going on. They don't want to earn money or they're confused. And so you get something like 98% of people saying bet. Okay. And importantly, you don't need to look at much of the matrix. Right? If we tell you, you're player one and uh, the state is C, you only need to look at two numbers, this payoff and this payoff. That's it. And so if we think people are a little bit lazy in looking, that is, there's a kind of minor cost of looking things up, they won't do it. Um, here's a D1 game. Now you know that the partition is A or B. Okay. So you say to yourself, well, look, you look, at, you look at this payoff and this payoff. Those are the possible paths you get if you bet. And you look at the S payoff. And by the way, these paths are going to change from trial to trial. So you have to constantly look afresh each time. Right? S might be really high, really low. Okay. So the D1 choice is that the min, that, that is the set of paths you need to look up to compute the Nash equilibrium, is 1B, 2A, and S. Um, so you look at this and say, you know, I could win 25, that's higher than 10, so I might want to bet. But I might win 5, that's less than 10, I might not want to bet. So I need to know if I'm going to win if the state's A. So you should look at this number, right? So a, a strategic player, this is going to be level 2, says, um, if the state is A and I bet, if the state's A, the other person is in a singleton information set, I can see that they're going to get 0, and I can guess you know, I can guess that they're going to look at this number and compare it to this number and choose not to bet. So I'm not going to get 25. That's, that, that comes from pure logic and from a belief that the other player is rational and from looking at the right numbers. Got it? If you don't get this, it's, you're lost. OK? So a rational player will say, I need to look at these payoffs and this payoff. And in order to know if I get this one or not, and I'm, or I'm stuck with five, I need to look and see, will this guy bet with me and let me win the 25? And the answer is, the, the predicted answer is no. Therefore, I should say not bet. That's the Nash equilibrium. Level one players, who aren't thinking that strategically, are going to say, well, the average of 25 and five is 15. I could get either one, as far as I know. I'll bet. So they're not looking at the other player's payoffs, and they're not doing this logical inference. And you can iterate this into two steps of reasoning, and it gets a little more interesting, but I'm going to skip that. OK. So here's some actual lookup percentages. So we're going to classify subjects. This is a combination of UCLA and Caltech subjects. They're not that different. The Caltech subjects are a little bit more analytical when you compare them. And um, uh, in the D2 games, that's one extra step of reasoning. The underlying numbers are the ones you need to be looking up, as well as S. So 82 people look at the minimum numbers and play Nash. And this is the percentage of times they look. They click on these boxes 24 times. Oh, I forgot to show you the display. But we use it, what's called mouse tracking, which means everything is blanked out like in Jeopardy. And when you move your mouse in and hold the, the mouse down, um, the number pops up. And when you move the mouse out, it shrinks again. So it's kind of like cheapo eye tracking, right? You know, instead of actually tracking your eye, you're using the mouse to open the number up. And we assume that when you, you we record how long you're looking at it, and we try to make a guess about how many steps of reasoning you're doing. The most common behavior actually is down here. These are people who do not look at all the lookups. Basically, they look at here, 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 here. They barely look at this one. And as a result, they often say, oh, I'd really like to bet, and they shouldn't. They're doing nine clicks, and they're only spending four seconds. So the, uh, I'm skipping all of the machinery, but what we do in the paper is to, um, is to try to kind of decode or classify, given what people look at and what they do, do they see me doing zero, one, two, three steps of reasoning? And it turns out we also do a cluster analysis. So we get kind of four clusters. And they roughly map into ones, twos, and threes. Except there's one cluster that looks at the things that level two players would need to look at. So they're looking at the right payoffs. But then they don't choose the Nash bet. 
So they're, they're, they're looking at more information and somehow not using it in their choice process, which is something we hadn't really thought of before. So that's a new feature of the, the game. It's as if they're, it maybe that they're noisily responding. And even though they looked at something, it's not getting into a calculation. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to quickly say something about endogenizing thinking steps. So early in our research, we, you know, we, wanted, we would like to be able to derive f of k from some deeper principle. Right, not just see it in the brain or see it in patterns of eye tracking and fit data. And we haven't tried to do that yet. But uh, Aloui and Penta did from Pompeo Fabra. And so they used kind of a cost benefit approach, which we mentioned in our paper just to put it out there. And so that 10 years later, I can say, oh, we thought of that first. But we didn't really do anything clever with it. And so the idea here is that if you do a couple steps of thinking, maybe you then figure yourself, is it worth doing more thinking? And the problem is, how do you adjust, how do you figure out if it's worth doing a third step of thinking? Once you've done all the machinery, you've already done the third step of thinking, you might as well use it. So what they do is a little clever. They basically say, we, I think about, we think about what payoff you would get if you do k minus 1 steps. And then as you're thinking about the kth step, you're optimistic. You say, well, suppose if I did another step, I would get the highest possible payoff. I would somehow figure out how to get that payoff, or figure out that I will get that payoff. And if that gap is big enough, if it's bigger than some sh shadow cost, I'm going to do more reasoning. Um, anyway, so they use this parametrically and they're able to fit some data this way. I'm going to skip the details. Okay, what's level zero? This is different than the Green College talk, kind of brand new. So here's my current view, which is level zero and these people are fast and they're doing something that's salient. Now what's salient, right? So I think we, we have some scientific things to say about this and some is just intuitions that need to be measured and we need to think about more carefully. One thing that's salient is what you might call personal numbers. Like in the, in the um, 0 to 100 game I started out with, in Rosemary Nagel's thesis, you can read the whole thesis. It has these debriefings where people wrote down why they picked numbers. And somebody picked 18, which was really close to the winner. And the person said, I'm 18 years old. Right? <laughs> so that's a cool illustration of how they, they did something actually that was close, close to sort of sophisticated, but not for a sophisticated reason. So if we were coding them, we would say that's a level 0 who happened to make you know, a smart choice. Uh, another thing we might see is that if there are numbers, people may choose the ends of the number line because they're so prominent in some way, or maybe the center. Uh, finally, I'll come back to this one in a second. A lot of games were interested in private information games, like an auction. I know how much something is worth to me. What am I going to bid? Uh, our hunch is that, based on a couple of data sets, is that if this set of the states is, say, a set of integers, and the actions you can pick is a set of integers, or maybe a set of real numbers, then there often will be a, a linkage function or a natural mapping from the states you know to the actions you choose. For example, in, a, in, a, in an auction, in an experiment, let's say my, my private valuation for a good is $22, I might bid 22. Or my signal in a common value auction where the winner's curse is common might be 67, and I might bid 67. Okay. And so there's some games in which um, in which you should basically lie and exaggerate, and people often are overly honest, which we think might be kind of a heuristic. Right? Like the stage is three, and I should bullshit you and say, oh, your, your car really needs $500 of repairs, but I know that the true state is $300 of repairs. And what we see in the lab is that people are often unusually honest. They're more honest than predicted by theory. And uh, finally, another notion of salience comes from the E.T. Koch algorithm. How many people know this? Some of you should know from visual science. Yeah, OK, one. Um, uh, Christo was my colleague at Caltech until recently. Now he's at the Allen Brain Institute. This is a beautiful paper. So basically what they do is they're going to feed an input image in, and they're going to um, look at coarse and fine scales. They're going to look at color, um, uh, brightness, contrast. Then they, they, um, they collect a bunch of futures, compiscuity. They construct these kind of salience maps, and they put them all back together. They build in something like inhibition of return. That means if you look at one spot, you don't keep looking at it again. And uh, you can get their software online. We've used it. And it works pretty well. So if you, if you feed in a picture like this, their algorithm takes apart all these features, and it predicts where you're going to look. This is called the salience map. So it predicts you're going to look here first, and then here, and here, and here. And so it gives you a numerical prediction of which order you're going to look at the things in the picture. So we actually use this in a bunch of shelling games, so shelling matching games. The matching game is very simple. There's a class of objects. And we're both going to pick one simultaneously. If we match, we win a fixed prize. That's it. It's something Shelley introduced as a kind of a device to get people to think about kind of shared salience and um, 
common under shared understanding, and that has some application of linguistics and areas like that. So in his book, Schelling says, here's a crude map. Suppose you and another paratrooper are dropped in. This is in the kind of the height of the Cold War, right? Suppose you and another paratrooper are, dro uh, are dropped in, and um, you have this map. But you, you don't have any walkie-talkies and ways to communicate. No cell phones, 1960. Right? Where do you go to meet the other person? You both want to meet each other to be safe. So you have to pick a place that another person's going to pick, knowing that you're trying to pick a place, and blah, 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 blah. And so Schelling said, well, the bridge in the center is kind of focal. So he used the word focal, or psychologically prominent. He said people will find a focal point. But he didn't really say much more psychologically about what that was. If you run this through the Itikok algorithm, it says they're going to look here first. Then they're going to look there. Then they're going to look there. That's, those are predictions from this algorithm. Christopher Hogg never heard of Schelling until we started talking to him about it. And we ran some experiments, and it turns out that 59% of the people pick here. 24% um, pick X, which the algorithm does not pick. So the algorithm is not perfect. And 5% pick Y. Okay. Here's some more examples. This one might seem like a trick, but it turns out that color red is very prominent. So if you have a display of a bunch of symbols and one's red, they're going to look at the red one. And sure enough, 82% of the people looked at red. So the algorithm, number one, means that's the first place you should look. Um, and the next place you should look is here and here. And we don't see very much of that, just a trace. So it, when you have something that really pops out, people pick it and the algorithm picks it. Here's another example. This is um, another case of these matching games. And by the way, in the, the, Shelley's point was that in these matching games, um, every choice is in equilibrium, right? If I think people are going to pick the low circle, I'll pick the low circle. And if everyone thinks everyone thinks the low circle, that's an equilibrium choice. So is diamond. So is high circle. So is middle triangle. So is square, right? And as Shelley pointed out, there may even be cultural standards. Like it might be that in your, in your cult, your small scale society is like Squareopolis. In Squareopolis, we really worship squares. They're so beautiful. And if you play this game with the Squareopolis residents, they're all going to pick the square. Or there could be Diamondopolis. And Diamondopolis, they'll pick the diamond. So we think what's, this is tapping into something like shared salience, right? Is that everyone knows there's something which is prominent and everyone's going to pick that. But the algorithm doesn't use shared. It doesn't use any cultural. It's purely these bottom up, very low, we call low level visual features that you're gonna, your eye is going to grab onto in the first 500,000 milliseconds. The algorithm says 72 per, says this is what you should look at first. Um, uh, I think this is second, this is third, this is fourth, this is fifth. And so 73% of the people pick the thing that the algorithm says you look at first. 24% of the people pick the thing that's fourth. So again, the algorithm is pretty good at your initial choices, not so great. And the algorithm also fails miserably on categorical distinctiveness, because it just sees these things as lines. So they don't have any semantic content. So in this game, there's a bunch of um, consonants and vowels. 40% of the people pick U, because it's the unique vowel. It's a, it's a unique vowel. So if you have a concept of consonant vowel and you want to choose, you know, there's a whole bunch of consonants and there's just one vowel, you don't know which consonant to pick unless there's some other focality principle guiding you. So 40% of the people pick U. What the algorithm does is to say, oh, this N, this one's really going to be the winner. That's going to be the winner. 2% of the people pick that. Oh, how about P? Eh, 6%. K? K? The N, P, and K are picked out because they have funny orientations and that sort of pops out visually. But that is not what people pick. So th this visual salience is going to be good for very simple bottom-up um, reactions, but not for anything else. OK. Uh, almost done. Uh, finally, I said I'd come back to level zero. This is what Kevin and James have done. i just tell you what they have done. Um, what they did was to say, maybe what level zero types are doing is they're noticing features of strategies. That's what I just talked about, like where they are visually. Or, you know, or payoffs, features of the payoffs the different strategies give. And maybe what we can do is we can look at a meta model, which is kind of a linear combination of these sort of features, and that would give us a better level zero model. And then that would give us a better overall fit if we think that level ones are do, doing that level zero, or anticipating that level zero belief. And so what they find is, looking at several data sets, I guess eight, that the best fitting uh, meta model is that level zero has put about half of the weight on fairness which is the action that has the lowest absolute gap between high and low payoffs. So if there's basically a row of the matrix in which the gaps are really big, they're not going to pick that one. If there's a row of the matrix where the gaps are small, they're going to pick that one. 
And then there's some other criteria like max and max. That means you look, you quickly scan the matrix and whatever's the biggest one for you is what you think what level zeros will do. And then level ones think level zeros will do that. Okay. And the final thing, this is a, um, a plot of number of parameters versus fit. If you like parsimony, you want to be in this direction. And if you like fit, you want to be in this direction. So there's a kind of efficient frontier. This is some data from earlier work by them. This is the uniform level zero. If level zeros are just uniform across rows of a matrix, you get you have one parameter and pretty good fit. But the fit is much better, like 10, 10 to the 10th times better in likelihood, much better, um, if you start to put in more of these kind of features. So they've been thinking about level zero as attending to payoff features of strategies. We've been thinking about visual salience, these ideas of kind of personal lucky numbers and stuff like that. And eventually, we'd like to be able to consolidate that, that into something you know, a little bit more compact. We don't, we don't, we don't, want, to, we don't want to look at say, well, there's 17 types of level zero. Tell me which game, you know, which of the 17 types of games you're doing in your experiment, and I'll mail you back my level zero prediction. We'd like to do something. I, I think there may be two or three types, depending on structure, like if visual features really pop out, that's probably going to play a role, like a framing type effect. And in other cases, it's going to have to do with the structure of the payoff. So we may end up with, say, two or three facets of a reasonable level zero. But at least um, that's, that's going to be progress. Um, OK, so I, I talked about this cognitive hierarchy approach. I showed you lab data, field data. The loopy thing, remember, was, a, was field data. That was not an experiment. It just had a very nice, clear structure. So you could apply game theory. That's, that's kind of rare to just get such, clear, like such a clean kill in testing game theory from field data. Usually in areas like I.O., if you look at pricing and stuff like that, you have to make all kinds of assumptions on the payoffs and what people know. In Loopy, it was very simple. Uh, we have looked also at the cognitive science basis, and there are lots of things to um, investigate, including this. Thanks. Many of you would have questions for Colin, but I'll ask you to save those until uh, after our second speaker has, uh, has spoken. So I, I'm just going to jump up here to, uh, to quickly introduce him. Um, so you might be thinking to yourselves, I mean, you, you found this guy who's, you know, he's, he's a certified genius from the MacArthur Foundation. You know, he's a child prodigy, he had his own record label, he's a, practically a brain surgeon. I mean, what, what, what are you, the second guy, and you're making the other guy go second, that can hardly be fair. Uh, so let me tell you about the second guy and why I'm just so right. <laughs> so, so Michael Kearns is a, a professor in the Department of Computer Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he has secondary appointments in operations, uh, information management, and statistics at work. So he's already, again, kind of interdisciplinary himself. Um, his, uh, if you look at his bio, he spent about a decade at uh, Bell and AT&T Labs, ultimately as head of the AI department. If you look at the people he worked with at the time, it's a veritable who's who in uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and theoretical computer science. And when uh, AT&T uh, broke up, uh, AT&T Labs broke up, he uh, spent a year as a CTO of a venture capital firm and then joined uh, Penn, where he became a full-time faculty member. But you wouldn't know it by all the other things that he nevertheless did. Um, he spent five years uh, in and eventually uh, heading a quantitative trading uh, uh, team at Lehman Brothers until that broke up. He has bad uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite so, quite <laughs> so. <laughs> but that ended badly, but, uh, but not for Michael, because he, he moved on, uh, spent another couple years uh, heading a, a quant team at Bank of America, then four years heading a quant team at SAC. Uh, in the meantime, he advised another five startups, most of which were acquired, and some other venture companies. Um, now, currently, he's advisor to five different startups. He's involved in a seed venture capital fund. He's on the technical advisory board of MSR Cambridge, often works as an expert witness, and on the side, co-leads a quantitative trading team at a New York City hedge fund. All right. <laughs> Nevertheless, he purports to also do research in computer science. Uh, which turns out to be in machine learning, algorithmic game theory, computational finance, artificial intelligence, theoretical computer science, and social networks, many of which he'll tell you about today. And somehow on the side, he also is a founding director of two different centers at Penn, 
Um, one of which I think is really interesting, the uh, programming network and social systems engineering, because it really brings together all of these areas, particularly bridging economics and computer science at the undergraduate level. And I think it really helps to deliver on the promise that all of these ideas that indeed you've just been hearing about from Colin, uh, which often had their birth in, uh, uh, in economics, uh, nevertheless kind of come into computer science and really bridge the whole gamut from HCI all the way to theoretical computer science, as you'll see in Michael's talk. So, Michael. Okay, thanks. Um... Thank, thank you, Kevin, for the uh, overly kind introduction, um, which I think can be summarized by simply saying that I have a short attention span. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to tell you today about some research um, that I started maybe six or seven years ago. And um, one of the nice things about doing this week with Colin is that uh, he was really a direct inspiration in many ways for the work I'm going to tell you about. Um, because at that time I was starting to get quite interested, like Kevin and many other people, in computer science, in sort of economic and game theoretic viewpoints of both problems in computer science and then the attendant algorithmic problems that, that these models um, engender. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm originally from a machine learning background and still do a lot of work in that area, and even though I'm on the theory end of that, um, that community, I, I realized at some point that in hindsight I've greatly benefited from there being a, kind of an accompanying very large empirical community and components to machine learning research. So you get an idea um, and you get you know, an idea for an algorithm or a model and you, know, you can go find some data and try to see how it does. And that's a relatively easy thing to do. And after I'd been doing some work in algorithmic game theory for a while, I started thinking, like, well, you know, it'd be nice if there was that counterpart there as well. And you know, then you walk down this road. Well, there's not some data set you can just go out and see if your game theoretical model is any good. You would actually have to do experiments on human subjects. And I think, um, you know, uh, Colin's book that he he showed at the at the beginning, uh, which was published in about 2003, was very influential in my thinking and sort of looking at it and realizing, yeah, this is interesting. Um, you can learn fascinating things about it. You can test against theories. You can repair those theories to improve them in response to what you saw from the experiments. And so I started doing this line of experimentation that was kind of, um, I learned a lot from his book and from talking to him. And he was uh, somebody who encouraged me very strongly to, to kind of continue this after I'd started it. Um, and so here we are, sort of six or seven years later. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, when I gave this talk at Green College on Monday, which also followed Collins, it was a much more diverse audience, and it made sense to kind of adapt my talk to more directly kind of be couched in, in terms of traditional behavioral economics and game theory. But since this is a computer science audience, and, and I'm a computer scientist myself, um, I'm, I'm going to not make that tie as tight, but I think you'll, you'll see the connections. Um, and, and I'm going to take, I'm going to, on the first slide, just kind of raise a bunch of questions that um, sometimes when I think about these experiments, are questions that I hope that they can contribute towards, if not answering, at least framing. Um, so this is one of these slides where I'm going to raise a bunch of interesting questions that I will then proceed to not answer in the talk at all. But um, you know, at a high level, an interesting question, I think, is what computer science and economics have to say about human computation or social computation. Um, so I'm thinking about phenomena like crowdsourcing, citizen science, peer production, gamification, etc. cetera. Um, some of you may know about things like the ESP game, which was one of the first CAPTCHAs, um, things like Fold It, which was a very successful protein folding game, um, Galaxy Zoo, or even things that are a little less structured or more open-ended like Wikipedia. Um, and if you kind of step back from all of these very, very interesting case studies or systems, um, you know, one observation that is a very computer science-y one is that you sort of all are attacking problems that are in some sense embarrassingly parallelizable. So whatever the task is, it's possible to essentially just break it into, you know, many, many non-interacting instances, give each one of those instances to a single human subject, have them give you back an answer like, here's my configuration of this molecule that minimizes energy, and you know, and maybe do a little bit of um, error checking or robustness by by redundancy, sort of you know, taking two answers and seeing if they agree with each other and saying that's good enough. Okay, 
Um, so, you know, you have problems that are easily, and of course it makes sense that these are the systems we're seeing now because there are lots of problems that have that property. This is a partial, only a partial list, and it's also sort of the easiest to implement and think about, okay? Um, so, you know, problems that break into many non-interacting -inter pieces, etc. And one of the things that I've been interested in this line of work is, well, what about harder problems? What about problems where you want not just single subject solving problems, but maybe a larger workforce? And a larger workforce that isn't just going to sort of do their own thing and then you're going to somehow have the machine aggregated, but you really want coordination um, by, by the subject. Sort of there's interdependence between their decisions. And you know, you can't sort of have somebody doing something over here that isn't coordinated with what's going on over here. You have to sort of piece the solutions together along the lines of a jigsaw puzzle. Okay? And if you sort of start thinking down this road, you, you might ask, well, you know, if I wanted to solve problems like that, what would the design or engineering principles look like? And if you, you know, if you've had a couple of drinks and you're you're really um, kind of getting wild, you might think, well, is there a theory of social computation, right? If we sort of think about a future in which um, we have systems like the examples I'm giving here, in which you have a mixture of human cognition and labor and machines, um, you know, a good computer scientist could say, okay, you know, before we had memory and, you know, registers and CPU time, and these are all resources, and we want to figure out how to engineer systems that sort of use those efficiently and parsimoniously. Well, so now we just happen to have like another unit or computational resource, which is things that people are good at doing. And, and, and things that machines may not be so good at, like you know, visual recognition tasks. And you might you know, ask, what would a theory of computation in which that type of unit was also available? And maybe, you know, maybe even like a complexity theory of social computation, which would tell us which problems should be more difficult or, or, or um, easier. And that might, I suspect, look very, very different than traditional centralized computational complexity. Okay. So these are all great questions. I'm not going to answer any of them. But they rattle around in my head at various times in designing some of these experiments. Um, the alternative view of what I'm going to talk about that's much more kind of directly related and inspired by, by Colin's work is that you can really think of the experiments I'm going to describe kind of in a more down-to-earth way as behavioral game theory experiments in which the population sizes are larger than two and in which there's a network structure mediating the, the strategic interaction between a group of subjects. Okay? So um, there's too much on this slide, so, I'll, but, so you can read it if you want, but I'll say everything you need to, to, to hear in English. Um, we've been running experiments now for six or seven years in which we bring in three dozen human subjects at a time into a laboratory of workstations. Everybody sits in a workstation, and we erect physical partitions that make sure you can only attend to your own screen, and we proctor them so that people can't talk to each other. Um, so the only communication is through the system. Um, subjects engage in a series of short experiments, a few minutes each, let's say. And in each experiment, um, there is an underlying network that's mediating the interaction. So there's a network of 36 vertices that nobody has a bird's eye view of and that we have designed or chosen as experimenters. And basically, 36 of you play a game with each other. And usually these, at least in the examples I'm going to talk about today, these, these games might be very, very simple. So to sort of dovetail with what I said on the last slide about you know, what problems are easier or harder for human subjects and does complexity theory have anything to say about it, you know, imagine thinking about graph coloring not as this thorny, super interesting but, but hard combinatorial problem that's useful for scheduling exams in a finite number of lecture halls. Think of it as actually a, a, a social game, a problem of social differentiation. You want to make a choice that distinguishes you from your neighbor. You want to pick a ringtone for your iPhone that's different than the ringtone of the people you spend a lot of time around so that you know, when the marimba goes off, not everybody has to look in their, in their purse or their pocket to see if it's for them. Okay? So imagine now a, a group of human subjects playing graph coloring. So there's some network. Everybody's controlling the color of their vertex. They only see the colors of their neighboring vertices, so it's only local interaction. And in all these games, it's you know, asynchronous move, change your colors as many times as you want. 
And as per the principles of behavioral game theory, we're paying for performance. So in each little experiment, if at the end of the experiment you're a different color than all of your neighbors, then you get paid something, let's say $2, and if you're the same color as one or more of your neighbors, you get nothing, okay? Um, so, you know, you can, this was the very first set of experiments we did, and I'll admit that it was almost kind of like a, a scientific joke to me to, you know, um, inflict on human subjects this problem that complexity theory tells us should be, should be very nasty. I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to suggest that, you know, um, man-machine ensembles can um, sort of, you know, show that P is equal to NP, but, but, you know, it's sort of a, a perverse, it's the kind of perverse thing I like to do in these experiments, see, see how subjects do in, in graphical. So this is the kind of thing we've been doing. Um, across many, many experimental sessions over the years, we've been deliberately varying a lot of things, but two main design variables. One is the network structure. So, you know, so one, one choice is what network over 36 vertices, which networks do you, do you, do you give to the subjects? And the other we've been varying, of course, is the nature of the task of the game. And um, a, a time is limited, so I'm not going to go into detail about how we choose each of these things. Um, there, I'll be the first to admit that there's a bit of a haphazard shotgun aspect to it, and we kind of do what seems interesting at the time, because the design space is too big to even hope to populate in any sort of systematic, dense way. So it seems just as good to kind of pick things that are sort of different points in it that are interesting. But at a high level, many of the networks that we've chosen have been inspired by the sort of literature on network science, things like preferential attachment, small world models, if you're familiar with these, even erdish Remy kind of truly random graphs, which nobody takes seriously as a model for social networks, um, but it's kind of a good baseline and has sort of interesting known properties because it's been studied for so long. And the task we've really chosen for their diversity along a couple of dimensions, such as you know, is it a competitive or a cooperative game? And, and also, what does, you know, what do various theories have to say about the problem, like complexity theory or equilibrium theories from economics, okay? Um, another slide you're not meant to read, um, but this slide just shows you all of the different tasks or problems that we've given to subjects in experiments over the year. We arrange the sessions by task because the thing that's expensive or time consuming to um, train the subjects on is a new task. Whereas once I explain graph coloring to a bunch of subjects and they get used to the interface, they're, they're quite adept at going through a series of short graph coloring experiments. But if I want to trade, change from you know, graph coloring to networks trading, that's a whole new game and I have to just describe that. So we sort of organize them by task. And you know, just to say a little bit about these, these if you're a complexity theorist, these run the gamut from the intractable to the barely tractable to the trivial. Okay, so at the intractable, we have graph coloring up here, and we also have independent set um, uh, consensus. So those are both NP hard problems. Again, in the worst case, centralized complexity asymptotically, um, but that doesn't stop us from giving them to people. Um, Consensus is simply the complement of graph coloring. You want to be the same color as your neighbors rather than a different color. And of course, nothing could be more trivial from the viewpoint of centralized computation. Just assign every vertex red, okay? Whereas things like networks trading are what I would call barely trackable because the sort of max welfare solutions or the, or the, you know, the configurations of play that would cause the subjects to make the most money in terms of, of earnings um, you can compute that given the network, um, but, and it's in polynomial time, but barely in the sense that the best known algorithm for the problem involves using linear programming as a subroutine. Not even, not even a single linear program, but a sort of a sequence of inductively constructed um, linear programs. Okay? And then there are other things in here which sort of, so those are examples in which the problem is sort of from computer science, and computer science has something possibly weak in these circumstances to say about it. Others of these are, are taken straight from kind of financial or economic models like networked trading or networked bargaining and biased voting I'll talk about. Um, it's another kind of coloring or coordination problem but with a, an interesting strategic twist. Um, just to give you sort of a sense of what it's like to be in these experiments, this would be a typical you know, screenshot of an interface for say graph coloring. Um, you know, there's a network of 36 vertices 
Um, your vertex is clearly identified in the middle with you. You see your neighboring vertices in this particular interface. We also chose to give you a little bit more information, which is which pairs of your neighbors are connected to each other or not. So you sort of have your, what's sometimes called an ego network by a sociologist or a first neighborhood view. Um, and then down at the bottom, there would typically be an action panel where you can just anytime you want to change your color, you know, right now this person is a different color than all of their neighbors, so maybe they don't want to change, but if one of their neighbors changed to, you know, yellow because one of their neighbors changed their color, you might change your color, okay? And, you know, your payoffs are displayed and uh, all of the games have a time limit and we tell you how much time has elapsed for remaining so that you have some sense of whether time's running out on you. Okay, so um, I have very nice kind of home movies of actual subject play, but, but those seem to you know, be time consuming because you have to watch them and, and narrate on them and things. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just give visualizations of what happens. <coughs> in the very first set of experiments we ran back in, I guess it was 2005, and we published the paper the following year. Um, these were the actual networks we gave to the subjects, okay? So, um, and if you ask, you know, where did we get these networks? You know, the, t the, the first three are sort of drawn randomly from the generative model known as the small worlds model, where you start with a, you know, a, a, a one-dimensional lattice, also known as a cycle, and you add some number of random chords, and in doing so, you sort of reduce the diameter of the network while also reducing the sort of clustering um, coefficient. Um, you know, so those are from a well-known statistical model. The bottom two are also from a well-known stochastic formation model known as preferential attachment, which was deliberately proposed um, as a simple, plausible model for generating networks that would reliably have a heavy tail degree distribution, um, a long tail degree distribution. So, you know, the sort of the formalization of hubs and connectors, all uh, uh, the tipping point, if you're familiar with that book. Um, but this is, this is, you know, truth in advertising and kind of typical, right? There's so many networks we can try, you can't try all of them, you have to have some guide to what you do, so you get some ideas from the literature of what people are proposing as naturalistic models of real social networks, and then maybe we throw in something kind of engineered just because we have some hypothesis about what might need to happen. So, you know, imagine yourself in one of these experiments and what you know and you don't know, right? So. You know, in, in, the, in the top one, so, so, you know, by the way, all of these are, are colored with an actual solution and a, and a solution with the minimum number of colors, okay? So this is a four colorable network and, and this is a, a, four, a, a solution using only four colors. And so you can see that there are great differences kind of in, you know, at a high level, the structure of these networks and sort of the dynamics that would need to happen in order for subjects to solve them. And remember, nobody in the experiments has the luxury of what you're seeing here. If you were a participant in the simple cycle, all you would know is that you have two neighbors and they're not connected to each other. You have no idea how many neighbors anybody else has. You have no idea that there's a sense of counterclockwise and clockwise to your two neighbors. You just have two neighbors and that's it. Okay, and, you, and there's two colors available and you need to coordinate with your two neighbors so that you're different colors with them, okay? Um, if I take a network like this, there are vertices in the middle of this network whose degree is in the teens but there's only four colors available, right? So it's quite likely, and in fact is the case, that in experiments, very soon in the experiment, those high degree vertices will find all four available colors used by their neighbors. And their only choice is which subset of neighbors to have a conflict with and hope that those conflicts go away by the actions of the neighbors, okay? So you can sort of already start to, you know, at a high level, reason in your head about the different dynamics that need to happen between the <coughs> participants in order to, you know, um, to solve these networks. Um, if I had time, I would show you the movies, but, you know, um, it turns out that, for instance, between the one on the upper left and the one on the lower right, the one on the lower right is much easier for subjects than the one on the upper left, okay? Um, whereas, you know, I think if I'd given you these graphs without any colors on them and two or four colored pencils respectively and ask you all to color these graphs, I'm sure all of you would be done with the cycle by now and I would posit that probably none of you would be done with preferential attachment. And so in you know, five minutes of play, they, don't, they tend to have, a, they struggle with finding a solution to the simple cycle and they, they, they <laughs> seem to quickly somehow find solutions to these preferential attachment problems, okay? So this is the kind of thing that we're doing. Um, 
to give a, a visualization of actual play. So, you know, in some of the experiments we've done things like what I just described, the networks are kind of, uh, you, know, um, you know, everything but the kitchen sink thrown in there. Um, other times we've, we've, we've done a more systematic um, investigation of network structure or, or been more constrained, okay? So we did a series of experiments actually doing both graph coloring and consensus in the same experiment. And those are nicely paired because even though they sort of have the opposite computational complexity, um, it's very easy to explain graph coloring to subjects, have them do 20 experiments on graph coloring, and then say, you know what, now we're going to change the rules and we're going to do 20 experiments in which you want to be the same color as your neighbor, right? So nobody's like, oh my god, you know, I can't even understand this, you know, it's like, like immediately they get it and they can, they can do it. And so you can do experiments where not only do you vary the network structure, but you vary the task, but between two closely cognitively related tasks that are easy for subjects to move back and forth between. In these experiments, we, we were more, you know, a little bit more disciplined in our choice of network, in our choice of networks. We, we basically um, used networks that were drawn from a generative model that starts with that specific network over, over 36 vertices. So this is a network consisting of six cliques of size six, um, so full interconnectivity but within each tribe or clan, if you like. And then each clan has a leader that's connected to the two leaders of the adjacent clan. So this is, and by the way, if, you, if you're familiar with the network science literature, this, this kind of model is, is rampant. You start with some base network, which is a cartoon, a stylized cartoon of a particular type of world in which you have, you know, little clusters or even, you know, sort of primitive societies that have complete interconnectivity, but then they have loose connectivity to the other communities. And then to generate a random network from this family, you have a single parameter, Q, which is a rewiring parameter. And what you do is you go around to every one of the edges within a tribe, and you flip a coin that has probability Q of coming up heads. If it comes up tails, you leave it in place. If it comes up heads, you delete that edge and replace it with a random long distance edge from one of the two endpoints to an arbitrary vertex anywhere in the network. So when Q is equal to zero, it's exactly this network. As Q becomes larger, you're gradually erasing this tribal structure you're seeing here and replacing it with random connectivity. And when Q is equal to one, of course, this initial network is a red herring, and you essentially have a random graph with the same edge density. Okay, okay. So that that's so this is sort of a, a much more systematic way of generating networks that sort of move between two extreme worlds, a completely random long distance connectivity model, and, and this tribal model that I'm showing you. Now, so what what are these pictures showing you? These pictures are showing you actually actual visual, visualizations of consensus games where everybody wants to be the same color as their neighbor um, for networks in which the value of Q is zero or small. Think like zero, 10, maybe 20 percent. So that this trial structure that you see here is largely still in place with some variation in long distance connectivity. And in each one of these diagrams along the x-axis is elapsed time in the experiment. And there's a row for every player. So you're seeing 36 rows here. And the position, the, the value, of course, is the, the, the color that that player was playing at that time in the experiment, okay? And unlike graph coloring, there's no obvious number of colors to give in these experiments since it's consensus, but in general, more makes it harder because it's a pure coordination problem, okay? Um, and so, you know, what's fascinating about these diagrams is they, they sort of show you at a single glance both interesting aspects of both individual and collective behavior, okay? Oh, and first of all, by the way, since the value of Q is small and this tribal structure is still largely in place, I'm of course arranging it so that the first six rows are, you know, the leftmost clique, the next six rows are the clique next to it, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So first of all, you know, at the collective level, you immediately see this sort of sensible um, block-like behavior. Initially, on the far left, when the experiment first starts, there's this great diversity of color choices as people enter the game and you know pick their favorite color or randomly pick a color. Very quickly, in almost all of them, you quickly go from the nine colors down to a, a, just a handful. Like this top one is, is, is you know maybe the cleanest example. You quickly go from nine colors down to three, um, you know yellow, brown, and red, and then you know about a third of the way of the experiment. Now it's just a battle between red and and yellow. Okay. Um, 
Uh, and you kind of see, and furthermore, you see, you know, when the, the, there tend to be changes in color as a group, right? So in that top one, you have those two brown cliques that basically, when they give up brown, they sort of do it almost simultaneously. Okay. Um, you also see all kinds of interesting acts of individual behavior. So you're seeing all kinds of signaling behavior. So here's, you can see this row here where somebody who's kind of in a sea of brown is occasionally toggling to, um, to yellow, presumably because they have a neighbor there and they have a color, you know, their, 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 their neighborhood is not unanimous so they can't be the same color as all their neighbors and they're experimenting around with seeing if they can get their, you know, their clique, their tribe, to change to yellow, okay? Um, you also see more mystifying acts of signaling, like kind of toggling through several colors in short succession, or playing a color for a long period of time that absolutely no one else in the room is playing. Um, who knows? Um, and, and, but then at the collective level, you can also you kind of really see how the network structure is influencing dynamics here, right? So this is maybe the best example here. We have a case where I mean, sort of everything is going on here, from individual behavior to collective behavior. But in terms of collective behavior, we pretty quickly get down to sort of this greenish, blue, and orange color. Um, the orange at some point dies out, and blue is almost one of the day, right? Where there's just one group at the top that's still holding out to this light green color. And sure enough, they shortly after that point um, give it up and switch over to blue. But not just before, they can cause this sort of trickle of green to propagate to the other side of the network and in fact take firm hold, right? Um, and then we're almost at blue again, but then you know green makes a comeback and of the roughly 20 experiments we ran of this kind, this was the only one in which they didn't reach unanimity across the network of color within the allotted couple of minutes or so, and it ends here at about 50-50. All the other ones actually end with unanimity, and that's why the, the diagram stops. Okay? Okay. So, uh, you know, this is a, you know, a high-level talk, and time is limited, so I'm not going to, you know, give a lot of precise results here, although they're all quite, quite well quantified in the paper, and, you know, statistical significances are reported. But, you know, what are, what are some of the top-level findings that we've made over the years in this series of experiments? One is that, and I'll quantify this towards the end, there's generally strong collective performance, so I'll, I'll quantify that eventually. But in summary, you know, across the wide variety of network structure and tasks we've thrown at them, they generally can kind of do, do everything we've given with a couple of notable exceptions. Um, Structure, network structure matters, and is a, you know, so, so you can definitely say within a given task which types of networks among the ones that we gave were harder and easier for the subject and sort of try to reason about why that might be so. Um, and maybe more interestingly, not only does structure matter, some networks are harder for graph coloring, like the cycle, and some are easier, like preferential attachment, but, but it, that, can, that's, that kind of statement can be very task specific even between tasks that are cognitively very similar. So for instance, this plot, this figure here, is essentially showing that um, as a function of this rewiring parameter in the generative model I showed you on the last slide, um, the difficulty for the human subjects of, for the consensus problem is becoming much easier as you replace this tribal structure with random connectivity, and coloring is becoming harder. So even though cognitively these problems are quite similar to each other, the systematic effects of this kind of uh, modification to network structure are having the opposite effects on, on the two tasks. And this sort of shows that there's some sense in which this massive literature kind of just marveling at and documenting um, the empirical topology of the network structure divorced from what the network is being used for is sort of nonsensical at some level. I mean, I don't think anybody thought otherwise, um, but, but this is sort of a stark illustration of that fact. You can have the same generative family and, you know, as you go from one side to the other, it's helping you on one problem and hurting you on a, you know, apparently related problem, at least from a, a conceptual standpoint. Okay, um, so, so the, these, the games I'm describing here are, I mean, the, the tasks I've described so far um, are what I would call pure coordination tasks. And they're also cooperative, or at least non-competitive. And what I might mean formally by that is that in all of these games, it's possible for everybody to get the highest possible payoff, right? Um, so we were giving people tasks where 
there are, um, you know, it's possible for everybody to be a different color than their neighbors, and of course in consensus it's possible for everybody to simultaneously be the same color and everybody to be getting a payoff. So here's a twist on consensus that's competitive, and what I mean by that is that if somebody, if one party is making a higher payoff, by definition somebody else must be making a lower payoff. So um, here's the twist. It's going to be the, it's going to be like consensus, except now there are only going to be two colors. There's going to be red and there's going to be blue. Okay, and the payoffs are now instead of being local, like you need to be the same color as all of your neighbors, it's going to be global. So the rule is going to be if in two minutes all 36 players reach unanimity to red, or all 36 reach unanimity to blue, everybody in the room is going to get paid something. Okay, if that condition doesn't hold then everybody gets nothing. If, we, if 35 of us are red and there's one blue, we all get nothing, okay? So there's a very strong force towards unanimity, okay? The twist is that in the same little two-minute experiment, I might get paid $1.50 if we reach red consensus and only 50 cents to blue. Bill might be the opposite. So we all want to reach unanimity, but we care in, in incentive terms about which we care and disagree on, 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 on what color we reach unanimity to. And so now we have this sort of third variable, task, network structure, but now the arrangement of these two incentive types in the network. And of course, this allows all kinds of perverse experiments like this one. <laughs> so these are all networks visualizations over 36 vertices. Let's just focus on the bottom one here. These are just, by the way, there's three networks here, and the two layouts on the left and the right are the same network, and I'm just emphasizing sort of um, the separation between the two types, or I'm just doing a standard layout which tries to put the high degrees in the middle. But in this network at the bottom, um, what I'm showing you is a network where there are 36 vertices, 30 of them, the ones that are colored blue, are, have a higher payoff for reaching unanimity to blue. Um, the, the six red ones, which is a small minority, have a higher payoff for reaching red, okay? But the red, the red vertices are not chosen arbitrarily. They are chosen to be the six vertices in the network with the highest degree. Okay? And these are preferential attachment networks which have a heavy tail degree distribution. So the degrees of the high degree ones are, are, are sort of considerably higher than the average. Okay? Or at least certainly the top few would be. Okay? Okay, so this is the experiment. And, and it's kind of, you know, a stylized test of the question whether a small but well-connected minority can systematically impose its preference uh, against the greater good of the majority, right? Because the maximum social welfare solution here is everybody playing blue, because then 30 people are getting their higher payoff rather than only six. Okay, so the efficient solution is all blue. So, you know, the answer to this question is a, a sort of a jaw-dropping yes. Um, in this particular experimental session, we ran 81 little biased voting experiments total. Only, a, only, a, a, only some of them were of this minority power type. We ran other ones with other network structures that I'm not telling you about. But the background success rate was 55 out of 81. So, you know, pretty good. Um, not perfect, but, you know, sort of like a two-thirds success rate, something like that. Um, if you look at the subset of the experiments, the 27 experiments where we had this minority power structure, uh, 24 of those reached unanimity, so a much higher success rate. And every single one of those 24 reached unanimity to the minority preference. Okay? And just to sort of point out a particular way in which this is not obvious at all, remember that the high degree vertices, because they're high degree, have an extremely good sample across the rest of the network. And of course, at the beginning of the experiment, everybody initially chooses their higher payoff color. So this red minority wakes up and sees a sea of blue preferring players out there in the network. And it would be quite natural for them to acquiesce and say, wow, you know, I can see that the vast majority prefer blue. There's no way we're going to get my higher payoff, but let's make sure we get at least paid something. Um, and in fact, you'll see in the data um, frequent instances of exactly that kind of behavior. So you see that red vertex up there that prefers red, a short time later has changed to blue, okay? Who knows why they did it, but very possibly because they thought it was gonna be hard to get their preference. But somehow the dynamics always work out. These are sort of screenshots or, you know, samples of the actual state of a network in a, in a real, in one of the experiments. It always ends up eventually working its way back around to the minority preference. Okay. Um, 
Good. So um, I'll, I'll stop with this slide, even though I've got more, but I think we're out of time. I want to leave at least a couple minutes for questions. Um, so we did, a, you know, we did a long series of these experiments of this particular type that sort of wrapped up in 2011. We, we might still do more. Um, but let me summarize what happened in that, that sort of series of experiments that, that was on the list that I gave at the beginning. So at least at this population size, human subjects are remarkably good across a diverse set of tasks and a diverse set of network topologies. And you might say, well, how can I compare you know, how they did a graph coloring on preferential attachment networks and you know, networks bargaining on this other network structure. Well, so the beauty of you know, these experiments is that there's a common, you know, there's a, there's a common measure, which is money. Okay? So in any, in any single experiment I've given them, I know what the network structure looks like and I know what the payoff structure is, and so I can compute offline the maximum social welfare solution. I can compute what would have been the configuration of play by the subjects that would have caused me to have to pay the most to the subjects in payments. Okay? And I can sum all those numbers up for every little few minute experiment we've given them over a six year period. And this is the maximum amount they could have earned. Okay? Um, and then of course I can put in the numerator how much they actually earned. And across everything I've described to you and all the things I did, that number is close to 90%. So they've left less, let well, you know, a, a very small fraction of the possible earnings on the table. And this, you know, kind of getting back to the original motivation, you know, sort of framing questions I gave at the beginning, this makes me think that it's possible um, for things like crowdsourcing, citizen science, related peer production systems to be more ambitious than they've been so far and to think about trying to solve problems that are not like, you know, um, Here's a bunch of, of news articles about companies, or is it a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment about the company? These sort of isolated um, transactional tasks that don't interact. I think people properly organized and incentivized can solve much more complicated problems. And I predict that you know, going forward, we'll start to see yielded crowdsourcing systems that, that actually kind of start walking down that road. Um, uh, and so let me stop there and maybe we'll both take questions together. Thank you. All right, so let me uh, get Colin back up here as well and uh, I'll invite all of your questions uh, to either of them and uh, I'll, uh, I guess we'll, we'll just go around. Yeah. Oh, yes, so uh, there was a mention of, of a meta, and I, I mean this sort of a different meta, but what happens as this research propagates to the cognitive hierarchy, right? If I know that about these results, like if you look at this, the Swedish lottery, right, as people learn how the game was played, you saw the results changing. But if right away I know that this is going to happen, right, I'll, I'll, I'll just leapfrog that, right? Or similarly with, with the minority uh, preference results, Right. If I know that this happens, then I will dig in more and scream my opinion louder and hold that longer. Right. And, and so, don't all of these effects change? Right. If I tune my my Poisson parameter differently because I because um, I'm expecting a different population of people out there. Right. That will shift over time. Right. Um, what is there a stability here? Like what happens to the as, you know, as people learn about the research, their behavior will change. Um. Well, I mean, I'm not too. That would be thrilling <laughs> for me, right? The, the, the all random the world, people, random you know, human subjects know. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, absolutely, right? I mean, if if you know, if 30 years from now, kids in high school or in stats or game theory all learn about this two thirds of the average game, and you still play it, you're going to get lots of lower numbers. But, but it's a little like the market, right? Like the stock markets, right? There's a really powerful incentive for people. They're probably reading all the stuff now and coding it up with the, with the fastest performance machines they can get, right? And they're having this battle. Does, is, are people studying this? Is this something that, is it interesting? Is it, um, does it just go to Nash equilibrium and live it? Well, one, I mean, one thing is true that the, um, if you look at these, most of the games in which we apply cognitive hierarchy, not all, are played, then played over and over. And so we, as I mentioned, I think of the cognitive hierarchy model as a model of kind of like initial conditions or pre-equilibrium. Like in the two-thirds of the average game, if you play over and over with one group of people with feedback, and in the Luby game, you saw from week one to week seven, 
you know, people converge to the Nash equilibrium. So na the Nash equilibrium is, is an answer to a question, approximately, which is what happens under stationary conditions when a, a group plays together. Um, but if, you know, if you, it's not like those guys are learning, like when they leave the lab and they've played this P-beauty contest 10 times and they're close to zero, and then they go to, you know, another lab and play another game, they don't start out as Nash equilibrium players, right? In other words, I don't think they're learning general principles of equilibrium computation. They're just kind of try and error adapting, like by RL or some kind of, some kind of policy, right? I mean, it, it, I'll say one quick thing. It is, it is true in finance, for example, in the, in the um, mid-'80s, people discovered this small firm effect and also a January effect. And those effects kind of got self-defeated by the fact that a lot of people knew the finance literature. They didn't probably read the original journal articles, but they started to hear about it. And so this is something that's called the Lucas Critique in Economics, right? Is that if, if, you know, if, there's, if there's an effect that means some people are making a mistake and people find out about that and they have an incentive to not make that mistake, the mistakes will disappear. That doesn't, but that doesn't mean the original findings are wrong. It just means that there's an adaptive process occurring. So I would like maybe get Michael a chance to, to speak to the role of behavioral game theory in finance, because I imagine you would have something yeah, to say to that, and, and then let's take another question. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, <clears throat> the last time I saw a column was a couple of years ago when I was still with my group at SAC. Um, and by the way, you know, the, the illustrious list of institutions I've been at, um, you know, for better right. or worse, in every case, we sort of, my group sort of left the, the place a little bit before, before you go whatever tragedy befell it. <laughs> and, and so there's sort of debate about whether like I, I you know, am prescient or, you know, or whether like I was the cause of these things. And, <laughs> trust me, Looks we're, like we're, we're far, far too small. I mean, I think certainly in, in but you know, um, at SAC there's an annual kind of quant conference in which we would invite, you know, kind of a, a set of speakers, some who were like from truly from empirical um, quantitative finance, but we would always, always, you know, invite at least one much more interesting speaker, at least to me. And one of the, you know, just a couple of years ago was Colin, um, and he came to talk about, you know, neuroeconomics and possible. So I think there's a great interest in it, um, but you know, I don't, you know, and and everybody kind of sees the possibility that by having kind of a better understanding of trader behavior, but you know, the problem is there's just so many sources of noise in actual trading and markets. That um, you know, I don't know of anybody who's actually managed to kind of take those sorts of findings and kind of get you know sort of find alpha as they would call it on Wall Street, sort of find sort of predictive signals, um, and that's because even if you have a kind of even reasonably good model of individual trader behavior, um, you know, when you kind of aggregate that together along with all of the you know, institutional and, and other constraints that any given group has on its behavior, I think those sorts of effects are, are sort of washed out by, you know, more obvious things like, oh, hey, you know, five analysts in a row downgraded their estimate of this stock. And, you know, you sort of know how people are going to react to that. And that's not sort of really behavioral, you know, finance. That's just sort of, you know, people reacting to news or perception of news. So I think it's very relevant. But it's sort of, I mean, maybe a better way of putting it is that I think the, the instances in which those kinds of signal are strongest are kind of things that people knew already and just didn't call behavioral finance. Um, but, you know, I, I bet it'll happen eventually. Uh, but, but probably it would be better in sort of smaller, less liquid markets where sort of individual traders have more impact. Okay, let's see if we can get a, maybe another couple of questions. If we can keep the questions and answers short, then we'll, uh, uh, we'll get a couple more and we'll wrap up. Um, so, um, it's not a question, just related to what, what you said, um, what you asked and what you responded. Uh, there's a book, uh, Engine, Not a Camera, uh, is about, uh, I guess, analysis of uh, financial markets and how they essentially, how the use of these financial models uh, essentially is uh, not really just looking at it, but also they act on it and they become engines of how they trade. What's the book again? The engine, not uh, an engine, not a camera. An engine, not a camera. Yeah, by oh, Donald yeah, I mean, McKenzie. Really, really common. All right, we'll add that to our reading list, and uh, let's see if we have another question. Thanks. Um, I have a question about uh, your minority power scenario. Yeah. Um, for the players that were in the majority color, what was their distribution of their neighbors? Like in the um, 
So, I mean, the the short, unsatisfying answer is that sort of the, it's the distribution that you know preferential attachment generates. But um, you know, I, I think they have a lot of low degree. I mean, because most of the vertices have low degree, they have you know the majority of their neighbors are sort of low degree vertices. But there's also probably reasonable connectivity between the minority itself. What would I mean is like are they mostly red neighbors? As a result of Red having more, uh, no, 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 no. So, so you would definitely like if you just go actually look at the network, you would see that the minority players. That there's not enough in the minority to account for their high degree. So the vast majority of their neighbors are going to be outside of the minority, which is why when the experiment starts, they're the ones who see, ah, uh, you know, everybody prefers blue, and they might, you know, depending on personality, acquiesce, but somehow. You know the connectivity properties and the dynamics of subject play always end up working back to the minority preference. All right. Well, I guess we can see from uh, their accomplishments and the list of different topics that they covered in their talks that uh, both Michael and Colin have short attention spans. But I, I want to thank all of you for having such a long attention span and making it through all of this. And uh, let's uh, thank them again. And. Uh, in the room a bit longer if any more of you have questions you'd like to come up with.